Good afternoon or uh, whatever time it happens to be when you will be watching this. Uh, I'd like to welcome you today to uh, the second vodcast in our Reversing the Resource Curse campaign that we at Good Governance Africa are running. My name is Ross Harvey. I'm the Director of Research and Programs at Good Governance Africa. Uh, and it's my joy and privilege today to welcome our special guests, uh, Deji Hastrup uh, and Busisipo Siobi. Uh, Deji is the uh, CEO and Chief Consultant at uh, Strategic Communication Solutions, and uh, Busisipo Siobi is the lead researcher on the Natural Resource Governance Program at Good Governance Africa. And I'll, I'll invite her in a second to explain to us a little bit about the purpose of this campaign. Uh, but I really just wanted to begin by thanking Deji for not only his hospitality here at his home, but also uh, for the way in which he has generously shared his wisdom with us uh, over many years. And uh, today we wanted to take the opportunity to really uh, glean as much of that wisdom as we, we possibly can for the sake of uh, improving our world uh, and for ensuring that the extractive industries, which are so prevalent on our continent, uh, actually do catalyze broad-based development rather than uh, extracting resources and rents and creating fragility and, and other uh, manifestations that are contrary to development. So on that note, I'd like to just briefly hand over to, to Busi. Over to you. Tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, your interest in natural resource governance and then perhaps also uh, for our viewers, shed some light on uh, this campaign that we are running. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. I am Busi Siobi, originally from the beautiful Cape Town, South Africa. I studied public policy and administration at the University of, of Cape Town. And soon after finishing my undergraduate, I decided to actually pursue my master's in, in public policy and administration. Then I came across the South African Institute of International Affairs, specifically the Governance of Africa's Resources Program, where I met Dr. Ross Harvey. And that's where the real passion for, for research and the mining industry specifically came into play. Post completing my master's and my time spent at the South African Institute of International Affairs, as a research scholar, I then wanted to really understand a bit more about how can we actually ensure that the mining industry is used as a catalyst to contribute towards economic growth, but most importantly, broad-based socioeconomic development in South Africa specifically. Post my time at SIA, I then joined SRM, which is a risk consulting firm where I headed up the monitor desk of the corporate intelligence unit. And I was still unhappy because I really wanted to go back into the mining space and really make sure that I use my public policy knowledge and ensure that I do research in, in the space as well. That's when I did a bit of more research and came across Good Governance Africa, the natural resource governance program where I am currently the lead researcher and Ross, just to come to your second point now around the reversing the resource curse campaign, which is actually the third iteration of our Wicked Conversation at GGA. And essentially, part of GGA in the Natural Resource Governance Program, we aim to improve transparency and accountability in the extractives industry and across the continent, that is. And part of this, we want to ensure that our audience and help them make sure that they understand how mining can be used as part of contributing towards development. We want to make sure that our audience is able to understand how the resource curse manifests in mining jurisdictions, but most importantly, ensure that we improve governance interventions and ensuring that transparency can really lead to accountability. Now, part of this campaign, we decided to team up with thought leaders and industry thinkers and ensure that they also contribute to this campaign by helping us unpack the resource curse, but most importantly, help us come with solutions 
in bettering governance in the natural resource space, specifically the mining and extractives sector. Boise, thank you very much for sharing with us. Uh, indeed, uh, the wicked conversation that we uh, run at, at GGA is, is about trying to understand complex problems with uh, multifaceted, uh, multi-causal variables at play. Uh, and, and so we know that solutions are not simple. But as Busi said, what we really want to do here is try and shift the needle. We want new thinking to permeate how we think about ensuring that minerals and metals actually play a role in development rather than uh, in creating underdevelopment. And now part of that uh, solution set, if you like, that we've come across that has been extremely compelling for us has been articulated by our guest Deji. Uh, and Deji talks about mainstreaming social performance. And when you hear that term for the first time, uh, I hope that it makes you sit up and listen and, uh, and maybe you'd really want to know, know more. I'm not going to give it away just yet, but uh, you can stew on that. Um, what I'd like to do is just uh, ask Deji about uh, his, his upbringing. Deji, I'd, I'd like to hear from you about... Uh, how your interests were shaped, how your uh, involvement in the extractive industries came about, uh, and then perhaps if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what you learned. But, but your story really is very fascinating to me, and so much of what we wanted to hear today was actually that, because I was saying to Deji earlier, you know, it's very easy uh, to, to see the five-minute soundbite, and, and Deji has brilliant soundbites to share, but we also think it's equally important to understand where somebody's come from, the things that have shaped them, uh, and, uh, and some of the factors that have generated the wisdom that, that is in uh, Deji. So Deji, uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, um, Ross, uh, for that very generous introduction. I almost could not recognize myself, um, but it's always a delight to uh, have these conversations. Uh, it's been uh, a privilege and a pleasure to deal with GGA on these issues that we all are very passionate about. I, I started many years ago a career in broadcasting at a time when I thought that that would be my lifelong career. But things soon took a different turn and I ventured into public affairs. I actually started working for the US government embassy in Nigeria in the public affairs department and I was there for a few years until the passion to do something more for the community caught uh, my fancy. And then I went to work for a research institute. It's an agricultural research institute. It's funded by the World Bank. It's called the IITA, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. And I was the public affairs manager for that institute for a few years. It was a very delightful career because I had to deal with many local farmers. And um, when you have to take uh, research, done in the pristine laboratories of scientists to local farmers who hardly speak English, who don't understand the science of it, but they have to adapt and adopt your research findings mm -hmm. onto their local farms. It's a very interesting way to earn a living, and I enjoyed it very much. But very soon, uh, a company, uh, an international oil and gas company known as Chevron, needed someone to deal with local communities and they needed to hire someone who they said uh, could help with conflict and communication. Deji, just tell me, when you, when you saw that need, was there something both in the career that you've described so far or even something in your upbringing that alerted you and said, this might be for me? You know, was there something in your pre-research upbringing that uh, that, that was instrumental here, maybe in shaping how things evolved? I, I've always been interested in, in opposites and, and the, the idea of David and Goliath, the, the idea of science and rural communities, the idea of giant oil companies and, and, and rural 
communities have always interested me. I've always wanted to see how you could um, bring new ways into doing old things. And so when this opportunity came, I'd never done anything like that before, but it was something that immediately said, said to me, I should, I should try it. And so here we are, this oil company has been in business for nearly 100 years, but had never really had to deal with the new uh, uh, challenges that it was facing in some of the local communities. And here was I, who had been dealing with local farmers, trying to adapt and adopt new technologies for their farms. Uh, and, and, and so it was a wonderful opportunity to put my expertise and my desire to learn into, into practice. And Chevron is such a wonderful uh, company. It was open to new ideas. It understood that the world was changing and that um, there is no reason why natural resources that countries have been endowed with should turn out to be a curse mm. for those countries. Um, rather, these, these resources are put in there in creation to help uh, human beings, to help plants and animals, and, and so that um, all, all these can live together in harmony. So the, the idea that something that had the potential to be of enormous benefit could actually turn out to be a curse is, is something that was very interesting uh, for me. And, and I was lucky to find myself with a company that was receptive to new ideas. Right. So Deji, that's fascinating. Is, is, is there something about Chevron that was unique. Do you think, you know, what, what was it about the company that actually made them amenable to, to new ideas? Uh, in fact, part of what we were mentioning earlier is that companies often are recalcitrant, often intransigent, uh, unwilling to engage with new ideas for, for any host of reasons. Um, so, uh, to, to your mind, was there something unique, something built into the ethos of Chevron that maybe explains why they were willing to go down this path? That's a very interesting question, Ross. I, the only thing I could think of is Chevron prides itself in being a company that understands that um, knowledge is off the shelf. Any company can acquire the knowledge. You, you can hire some of the smartest people. So all of the uh, extractive industry um, have very smart people working for them. but. The differentiator from one company to the other is, is not what you know, it's how you apply it. And Chevron has always believed that um, the results you accomplish is not, is not just the result you want, but how you accomplish it. So the process must be as good as the result. So for Chevron, it was always more important to work on the process because in the end, um, achieving the result is not good enough, it's how you, you have accomplished it. And, and so Chevron was always about people. It was always about its employees, it was always about the local communities, it, it, was, it, it was its pride. It wanted to be known as the company that prides itself in its people, and by people it, it, it always defined it as not just the employees, but the local communities, the government, the people that they deal with, such as government, media, local communities, and their employees. So it was a people-oriented company. And so that, that itself means that if, if you have ideas that would improve the relationship between the stakeholders, mm -hmm. it was always welcome at Chevron. So uh, I, I think that's, that's one thing that I can say separates um, uh, Chevron from the other companies. The other thing is that Chevron is a very proactive company. Chevron was always thinking ahead. It was, al it was always not just about looking back, but looking forward and asking yourself questions that are not being asked. And I think that those, those were the things that I could, I could th think of. Yeah, and the other thing, the third thing which you had alluded to is uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. 
is Chevron had started to feel the necessity to engage more with local communities because some of the things that uh, local communities were willing to uh, let the company get away with in the past, they weren't going to allow it anymore. And, and, and so Chevron wanted to be uh, in the lead of this new partnership with, with the, with the so Chevron was always about people and partnerships, so it would always call itself the P company. <laughs> uh, well, which is fascinating because, you know, we find in the extractive space there are a lot of companies that talk that kind of talk, but they don't necessarily walk the walk. Um, you'll find a lot of companies saying, for instance, people are assets, we're really concerned about people and communities, but then when you examine how they actually go about it, uh, probably speaks to your point that the process actually doesn't seem to be as solid as the uh, intended result and and therefore sometimes the intended result is actually suboptimal. Um, so Deji, in your experience, you know, was there some, it, it seems to me from what you've said now that there was something fortuitous about uh, the, the integration of a good leadership ethos within the company uh, combined with the external reality that right. communities weren't going to take this anymore. And, and how do you think that came to be? And, and how, how would you suggest other companies actually uh, learn from that so that it can be replicated, scaled up? Um, what, you know, what is it that could help companies move from uh, merely talking about these things to actually living it and practicing it? I think for most companies, especially um, the extractive industry, the whole idea of value addition mm. is extremely important. If, if something does not add value, it's very difficult for a company to adopt such a thing and therefore, it's important to understand the value of partnership, the, the, the value of uh, adding value to natural resources. So is, is, is the ultimate expression of business profit. The, these are the kind of questions that you have to ask yourself. Is there more value to be added than just making profit? What separates my company from the other company? What legacy do I want to leave behind when I'm no longer here and I've exited? So for instance, one of the ethos of, of Chevron is to go into a place with a good plan of what you want to leave behind when you leave the place. And you, it, it doesn't make too much sense to start thinking of what to leave behind when you're about to leave. Mm -hmm. But if you put that in a plan before you go in, you have a long time to plan for your living. Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's the exit strategy. And so Chevron has all these processes in place. There's no need to go into a place if it's not going to add value to the business and to the community. And there's no need to go into a place if you're not able to leave the place better than you met it. So these kinds of thinking permeates from the CEO down to the, um, the littlest person in the company. Right. And so presumably when the next person comes in, uh, they inherit this ethos that is actually permeated through the structures of the company, which is, is really fascinating. So... Daji, I just wanted to take you back to, to Nigeria, uh, the context of the time, uh, the fragility, the conflict, uh, the, the governance challenges, uh, especially at federal level uh, at the time when you uh, joined Chevron. And, and how, how was what Chevron was doing received by the Nigerian government? And did other oil companies follow suit? Um, and part of why I ask that question, of course, is because I'd like to hear from you uh, about why you think mining companies, perhaps strangely enough, contrary to oil companies, have, have been relatively slow, at least in our estimation, uh, in adopting these kinds of principles that it seems would go a long way 
towards decreasing the fragility in the contexts in which they do operate. You know, one of the wonderful works of nature is that most of the times these wonderful, beautiful natural resources are found in some of the more difficult parts of the world. Uh, in, in some of these contexts, which we like to define as fragile contexts, um, business can actually be the differentiator. Uh, uh, business can add value to human existence in some of these uh, poor and fragile contexts. Um, in the case of uh, Chevron, it was operating along with other international oil companies in Nigeria and all of them were faced with uh, the same issues. Uh, but the challenge at the time was to understand the connections between uh, the external issues. What you consider to be external is not entirely external so long as it has impact on your business. So we came up with something that in those days we used to be called above the ground risks. The extractive business is mainly a business of managing risks and building resilience. I tell people that those are the really two major focus of any successful uh, business in the extractive industry mm. is it must manage uh, the risks in, in the business and it must build resilience so that you adapt to um, potential future, future risks. And some of these risks are not so obvious. Yeah. You know, many of the risks that the extractives think about are below the ground risks because you're searching for mineral resources, you're, you're searching for gold, diamond, platinum beneath the ground. But then there are risks to that business, uh, even above the ground, including risks like um, uh, community issues. These are very intrusive business. You go into a community, you affect their way of life, you, you need some of their water. In some cases, not just some, a lot of their water. You have to go into some ancestral lands uh, in, and, and you have impact on the environment as you, as you do things. You have impact on livelihoods. You have impact on people's culture, the way they live their life. So. It's important for business to understand that, that it's not an island. It operates within the context of people and places. And some of these are challenging situations. And where all of these meet is in, in factoring uh, social performance as a part of business performance. Once you understand that the extractive business cannot see itself as performing well if it has only taken care of the financial bottom line and not the environmental, social, health and other aspects that are quote-unquote extraneous to the business but have a potential impact on the business, then you can't, you can't check it off as being highly performing business. Right. A highly performing extractive business is one that has taken care of its social as well as its business performance. And, and, and so this has been my lifelong passion to integrate social performance into business performance right. in the extractive industry. It's amazing, Deji, and, and I, I think there's so much wisdom and value in this. And, and yet part of what exercises us is why there's been perhaps so little uptake of this kind of, of thinking. Um, and so Deji, I also wanted to ask you on this, I know you have a formula that you speak about, but, uh, but even in articulating that formula for us, could you also talk us through this question of risk uh, a little more deeply? Because it seems to me that there is often risk asymmetry at play in that the incentives that uh, that drive the way that companies do business seem often to be at odds with uh, long-run returns and actually managing long-run risks. And so you have this scenario, for instance, where 
uh, CEOs are judged on next quarter's performance. How much ore did we get out of the ground? How much revenue did we turn over? How much did our shareholders make? Um, and perhaps in the process, they take shortcuts um, and they build tail risks into the system that the next CEO has to pick up on and then can either address or overlook or try and hide. Um, so, so how would you uh, suggest that companies really get serious about, about risk and how they discount the future, because of course that's a critical element of, of risk. How, how, how do we change the, the structures more generally so that companies think more about uh, the long term? That's a very interesting question. Um, it's not just in business. In, in, if you imagine that in politics, in government, um, people face elections every four or five years and the electorate is going to judge a politician by what it has been able to contribute in the last four years. So every politician is very, very short-sighted. His great focus is the next election. However, there are, the world is not going to end at the next election, you know. So you've got to have a, a long-term focus. Any chief executive worth his salt understands that the, even the shareholders now understand the long-term view of companies. So it's a balance. You've got to keep the business going in the short term and you've got to factor in the business long-term sustainability. So you do not want to extract everything and make all the profit but leave nothing for your successor. And you're going to be judged, not just by what you are able to accomplish, but what you are able to leave behind. And, and so with this way of thinking, this long-term thinking, uh, chief executives are beginning to understand that the value that they contribute to a company is the legacy that they leave behind. It's not just what they accomplished while they were uh, CEO. And, and, and therefore, uh, they understand every, every mine, every hydrocarbon uh, deposit or, or, or field has a lifespan. And you, you've always got to think, how can I exploit in, in such a sustainable way that um, I do not short circuit this, this lifespan, but make sure that it's, in, it's productive throughout its, its lifespan. And, and when, you, when you understand the longevity that is, uh, is required, or the long-term thinking that is required to, to do this, then sustainability becomes part of your business uh, formula the understanding that your decisions are not just for now but also for the long term and and and, and that brings me to the the question that you asked about the formula yes. it's uh, it's a very simple formula is called <laughs> sesisira but what 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 sesisira means is se which is stakeholder engagement plus SIRA. SIRA is social impact and social risk assessment uh, plus SI. SI is social intervention or social investment is equal to SP, which is social performance. So what this formula says is that any... Um, extractive business, especially in, in a fragile context, must have as its foundation the need to engage with stakeholders. If you're moving into a, a new area, uh, maybe you're a multinational company and you're, you're expanding your business into virgin areas, you've got to understand the history, the culture, the sociology of the place, not just the geology right. of, of the place. The reason uh, for this is that without this full understanding, 
you are not just acquiring assets, you are acquiring risks. There are social risks in, in a fragile context. There are more social risks in a fragile context than in a normal context. So what, what do we mean by these social risks? You have high rates of unemployment in some of these places. You have uh, high incidence of infectious diseases. You, you have um, very, very weak governance institutions. You, the rule of law. Uh, you have high rate of unemployment. All of these might seem at first to be unconnected with the extractive business until you start extracting and then you, you begin to see the connections. But some of these social issues are not just issues for the society and government, but they're also issues for the extractive industry. They have to be factored into your plans before you make investments, not just after the investment before. Because if you make investments thinking that um, this is how much I need to invest and this is what the return is going to be on that investment and not factored in those risks, your numbers come out short in the long right. term. So the foundation of this is social impact and social risk. What do we mean by social impact? Social impact is what is the likely impact of my business on society. Right. You, you, you walk into a place and every time that you add a new context into an existing situation, there is an impact. Sometimes it's a positive impact, but other times it's not so positive. You've got to understand the full range of impact that the extractive business is going to have on the society, on, on the geology, on the environment of a place. And, 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 and you've got to do that ahead of investment. So that's social impact and risk assessment. When you collect all these data and you're able to analyze it, it gives you information to determine what social investments or intervention. Uh, for instance, you, you go into a place where there's just about enough water for the community and your business is going to require a lot of the water. Immediately, that's a potential cause for conflict. And therefore, part of the longevity or the sustenance of your business is to proactively mitigate conflict. Your social intervention plans must therefore factor in those risks so that those conflicts don't occur in the future. And, and so this formula is especially designed for fragile context. And uh, while it's not a one-size-fits-all, it tends to be very, very effective if you adhere very closely to what, what it, it uh, provides. Yeah, amazing, Deji. A yeah, very helpful formula there through which to think about some of these factors that are at play, especially in fragile contexts. Um, we've spoken quite a lot now about uh, how companies operating in these fragile jurisdictions can think about uh, how they should go about their business, how they should uh, reduce risk asymmetry, how they should treat local people. And I'll come back to you on that in a second. But I wanted to bring Busi into this conversation at this stage to just move us briefly away from uh, focus on company level intervention and to speak possibly about some of the external factors that uh, could drive uh, us away from the resource curse and turn resources into a blessing. And so, for instance, as, as you, you may, many of you will be familiar with, there are a number of uh, international mining codes, uh, the, the Natural Resources Charter, uh, the Africa Mining Vision, shaped specifically for our context. Um, and then, of course, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which was built on this idea that if we can uh, through various external incentives, uh, like adherence to the EITI, um, ensure greater transparency of revenue flows, we might be able to achieve better uh, social performance uh, and development. Uh, it doesn't always play out that way, and in part, I think because of some of the things you've mentioned, Deji, that um, <laughs> going into the field with your laboratory-produced uh, <laughs> 
uh, material doesn't necessarily land. There, there can be an incongruence there. Um, Busi has done some very interesting work on the EITI and Busi, I wanted to bring you in at this stage and, um, and maybe just share with us some of the things you've learned about the EITI. Uh, is it useful? Uh, should we pursue it? Should it be integrated with other initiatives? Uh, and, and if it is useful, how do you think we can persuade uh, governments and companies to really follow the spirit of, of the matter? Um, and then I'll, I'll come back to, to Deji after that. Thank you, Ross. And I think as you've touched on it already that there's been great effort put into ensuring and improving governance interventions such as the, the EITI which is a voluntary you know, process in which helps mining jurisdictions to improve transparency and, and hopefully lead to, to accountability. So the EITI was founded in, in 2003 and essentially it was aimed to really improve tra transparency and govern by disclosure, right? So enable implementing countries to be able to ensure that the whole entire extraction value chain is being disclosed from contracts to licenses that, that have been granted by mineral departments in that respective country, all the way to the spending on social and economic benefits for those communities specifically. At the moment, the, the EITI is implemented in 55 countries, uh, 26 of those being African countries. So there is a bit of traction there. There is a bit of appetite for mining jurisdictions within the African continent to really improve the, their transparency. However, through the research, you realize that there's a lot of key improvement areas that they could fo focus on. Uh, one of them is ensuring that there is more engagement uh, from civil society organizations, such as, you know, GGA. A lot of the times you'll find that civil society organizations have been undermined. You'll see, for instance, in the case with the Azerbaijan, yes. where it was suspended from the EITI, because it had undermined the civil society engagement in the process of the EITI. And one of the key things for the EITI, for it to be successful really, is to ensure that stakeholder engagement, not just from governments and, and mining companies, but most importantly, the civil society organizations. And I think another key improvement area when it comes to the EITI is that when there are any discrepancies that have been identified in the revenue reporting is that there's not much can, that can, they, they can do post that. So we really now require a cohesive, collaborative effort from mining codes such as the EITI, the government specifically in these implementing countries to ensure that their national regulatory bodies are able to run investigations that enable them to really understand and resolve those discrepancies when it comes to, to, to the revenues. But most importantly, it will require the collaborative effort, both from government, civil society, and of course, the key industry players, the mining sector itself. Right, Busi, yeah. So in fact, on that, and this is the, the critical question, is, you know, Deji has been explaining to us about the importance of a lived ethos, you know, of, of a culture of transparency. And, and of course, it strikes me that possibly one of the difficulties with the EITI is that it's kind of externally produced um, and now we're trying to uh, build in its ethos into some of these contexts, into mining companies and so on. Um, do you think that that is a, a fundamental weakness of the EITI? I know I'm throwing you a curveball question here, but, uh, but it's just something that struck me as, as interesting as we were speaking. Mm. Definitely can be seen as a weakness because it is an international mining code. And again, speaking to Deja's point around understanding the local context is so important. And I think one of the improvement kind of mechanisms that can be used in this instance is for international mining codes like the EI2I 
to partner with grassroots level organizations that have the understanding on the ground that can say that these are the social issues that we are experiencing and also take ownership, most importantly, of the EITI process, for instance. So certainly a weakness, but can be resolved through better engagement, but more so with engagement on, on the ground specifically. Okay. Yeah, very good, Busi. And I, I think, uh, by the way, if you're watching this and you want to understand more about the EITI, I'm, I'm just going to advertise Busi's excellent piece on the subject, um, which is uh, on our campaign page and I strongly encourage you to engage with that material. Um, it's, it's first class. But it, it, it's, it's, there are two things that we should say at this point. One is uh, the EITI is good as far as it goes and we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It has value. Um, adherence to it can signify that a, a company is committed uh, uh, rather that a country is committed to transparency, especially in the extractive industries, um, and that is valuable in and of itself, especially as it may uh, facilitate uh, foreign direct investment coming into the country. Um, but what it can't do is it can't necessarily get to that level of engagement at the at the deepest core, if you like, of the entities operating in the space. And Deji, uh, one of the things you've mentioned in our past conversations that struck me was the importance actually of taking the time required to build these relationships. And Mbusi was talking about uh, civil society groups. Um, you, you've been talking about the communities that are affected by uh, a high impact intervention, normally very long term. Um, and, and so you've uh, emphasized the importance of engaging in a way that isn't tick box um, and really building relationships uh, and and did you, you you know when you first started to articulate the importance of this kind of thing did you did you come up against any kind of resistance and and how has that been maybe, maybe first talk us through why it's so important to take the time you know this taking time to build relationships doesn't always uh, wash with a busy CEO's schedule um, or whatever the case might be, you, you know, and then beyond that, um, what, what was your experience in actually trying to get this message through? First of all, you, you've got to recognize you're dealing with people and, and people have emotions. They're not like machines. The extractive industry is a highly, first of all, you need technology and you need capital, but these are the tools you need and they, they, they are very efficient, very effective in, in delivering the results. But people are beings with emotions and so you require time and you require investment of, of, of your um, what you call emotional investment in a relationship. You have what you call annual reports, which means that you, are, uh, you, you have targets at the end of the year, what, have we met our targets? But human relationships do not have such short uh, focus. You've got to think of the long term. You're going to be in a, in a mining location for several years and you're, that means you're going to have relationship built over many years. Um, relationships are easy to destroy, they're not easy to build and therefore you've got to take your time to understand people, to understand their needs. One of the errors that uh, often occurs is that we want to antagonize people who antagonize us. We do not see that um, there is a mutual benefit in, in a relationship. And the thing is, a business has a focus on extracting and making uh, a fortune out of that business. But there, these, these are not the primary concerns of the local communities.
but they are stakeholders because they have been, you, are, you are investing in their land, they have provided you with, with their land. And you, you, so they, they are an integral part of your business. One of my pet uh, values that I'm trying to share with, with uh, the extractive industry is to understand that the ultimate goal of the extraction of natural resources is to add value to all stakeholders, not just to the business. In other words, the business is successful the business has been profitable when it has profited not just the business owners but the business subscribers which include the local communities, the government, the employees, it includes the shareholders, it includes the environment. Because without all of these the business cannot succeed for the sustainable future. So you've got to see that your, the success of your business the long-term success of your business depends on partnerships, on building resilience, on building uh, relationships with different entities. That's why stakeholder engagement is so fundamental to social performance and to business performance, especially in, in fragile contexts. Right. Yeah, and, and fascinatingly enough, Daji, I mean, your, your own experience has, has shown us that Chevron were able actually to, to generate profit and add value in the sense that you speak of in a fragile context like Nigeria's. Um, and, and at this stage as well, I want to bring Busi back into the conversation, just, um, but perhaps by way of preface, just to ask you, Daji, how, how a company should think about going about engaging with the ruling coalition and all of the uh, politically related challenges to doing business in a particular context. And I'm going to bring Busi in to maybe talk about rent-seeking, patronage, uh, some of those factors that are playing. In fact, let, let's do that uh, just, just as a, a way of setting the scene and then, and then I'll come back to Deji on, on how companies can engage in that kind of context. So part of uh, what fragility looks like, obviously, is uh, that there's unproductive rent-seeking that, that goes on, um, often because the particular natural resource in question is the only available form of wealth in a context of unemployment and hopelessness. Um, so, Busi, you've, you've done a little bit of work uh, recently on rent-seeking and, and patronage. Do you want to give us a, an idea just of, of how this uh, can operate at a, a higher level and then I'll come back to Deji to see how we think about navigating these uh, hurdles at a, at a more local level? Thank you, thank you, Ross. And I think just to contextualise it, right, in the campaign that we're currently running where we are trying to reverse this resource curse, yeah. which simply means, you know, where you have an abundance of natural resources, but however, the outcome, the economic, you know, benefits do not translate, you know, in, in reality. And we found that the key mechanisms and the driving forces that continue to operate the, re the curse itself and how it manifests mm -hmm. is through this, this rain seeking and, and patronage pathways that have been created, you know, by governing elites where they are essentially doing it for their own beneficial gains without it translating to economic growth and more importantly, broad-based socioeconomic d development where you'll find that the rents are, are the rent seeking happens within these mining jurisdictions and political ties and patronage pathways are then literally driving these these mechanisms in enabling the the curse to to perpetuate yeah. it itself and for instance most recently in the Daily Maverick Citizen, where they published a report where they've been able to trace the economic cartels in Zimbabwe specifically, where you'll find that there's been smuggling of, 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 of diamonds and, and goals, which is costing the country, you know, over $3 billion per year over the last decade or, or so. And this doesn't just translate within the mining sector, but also other um, various economic sectors such as 
agriculture, uh, energy as well. Mm. So I think in those two key mechanisms, Ross, you'll find that this enables the curse to perpetuate that doesn't actually breed economic growth and, and also socioeconomic de development. Yeah, it's well articulated, Busi. So it, it seems like we've often in fragile contexts got an elite bargain mm. where the nature of that bargain creates uh, political institutions that uh, mean that the resource is at the center of, of attracting rent. Um, economic institutions are then built to facilitate those rents going to the people who maintain that bargain, um, maintain the inner circle, you know, and uh, obviously uh, Dos Santos, uh, as president of Angola, was a good example of this, of, of managing to manipulate political and economic institutions to accumulate uh, oil rents so that he could then uh, play chess and musical chairs with, uh, with, uh, with his coalition. Um, and of course, he, that, that meant he managed to rule for 38 years, uh, but which in the end was tragic for Angola. So, Deji, at, at this point, um, what would your kind of advice be to companies operating in that kind of context? Of course, Nigeria is, is famously <laughs> kind of known for, for rent-seeking and, and patronage. Um, and in a context like Zimbabwe, for instance, we also see actually that there are uh, internationally renowned, reputable companies operating in that jurisdiction. Uh, what role do and should they play in this context where they, they surely know what's going on, you, they don't want to be a part of it necessarily, but uh, how do you navigate some of these hurdles uh, that, that the, are thrown up? The, the very idea of resource costs is what you're to touching on now because it, 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 it inflicts on a society um, the corruption and conflict that comes with the discovery of these natural resources and that's what is meant by the curse. So you have these natural resources that are supposed to add value to your life but instead what has it brought? It has brought rent seekers, it has brought corruption, it has brought conflict between the elite and the general population and so it's more or less a curse instead of um, it being, being of value. I think, uh, and, and these are caused more in, in a fragile context than in a normal context because the instruments of governance, the rule of law, the adherence to international norms, some of the things that uh, EITI is trying to institute are absent in most cases in some of these contexts. And, and, and one of the first things that companies can do is to understand that it's not adequate to have the legal license to operate. They also require the social license to operate. In order to have the social license to operate, you're not just dealing with one entity, the government. You're also dealing with a larger group of people, which means you're dealing with the civil society organizations, you're dealing with local communities, you're dealing with a number of stakeholders. And the more stakeholders are brought to the table, the more difficult it is for rent seekers to dominate the conversation. And, and, and so the, 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 it, it's, it's you would find that in a rent seeking situation, the rent seeker wants to dominate the relationship. It wants to be just between me and you. Sometimes it's just between government and the extractive business. Other times it's not just, it, it's not even just government. It's just an individual within government wants to, ex so the, it's, it's exclusion. Exclusion is, is, is uh, corruption thrives in exclusion. And so the whole idea of inclusivity, of partnerships, of bringing various stakeholders to the table is one way to prevent rent seeking, to prevent uh, the end result, which is resource costs from taking root. So what we have found is, uh, in the case of Chevron, we developed a, a policy of 
in inclusive engagement, multi-stakeholder engagement. So what you find is that it also reduces conflict yes. because um, you're, if, if, if I have a conflict with you, Ross, but, and you're not listening to me because you think that I'm ar arguing because I want this, the result to benefit me. If we're able to bring in Bussy, and Bussy says, no, wait a minute, I think Deji has a point, you're more likely to listen to her because you realize that she's not saying it because she's going to benefit, she's saying it because she thinks it's what is fair. Right. So one of the ways that you reduce conflict and you promote uh, transparency is inclusivity, is bringing in civil society organizations to interface with government and with community, right. is explaining to communities you know, it used to be said that communities can't understand the mining business. It's not true. And even when they don't understand, the fact that you're trying to explain what you do to them brings them closer to your business. Yes. And those are the values of relationship building and partnership and inclusive uh, stakeholder engagement. Terrific. Daji, thank you so much because, in fact, for me, that, that's just excellently articulated. You know, I've read a lot over the last 20 years about inclusivity and stakeholder engagement and so on. But what you've done for us here is lay out a rationale for inclusivity that crowds out unproductive rent seeking. And I think that that is a unique and valuable contribution. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I, I think we, we need to I really make more of that, of the value of inclusivity, not just as inherently good, because it is, but it actually also serves multiple other purposes that can help us to overcome uh, the, the curse. Um, as we wind this discussion down uh, to a close, I, I wanted to just touch on one last subject, and that is uh, the rules by which companies are, are bound. Um, you know, one of the things we discussed in our mining webinar uh, earlier this year was uh, the importance of the ESG principles and how that is starting to dominate how investors think about uh, where they put their money uh, and how that then in turn shapes company incentives. Uh, and, you know, so Busi, maybe I can bring you in here at that level. Do you think this is a valuable uh, progression? Um, and then Daisy, one of the questions I'm going to throw to you afterwards is uh, what about companies that are not bound by those kind of uh, jurisdictional listing rulings, for instance, um, and, and how do we persuade governments in fragile contexts to avoid doing business with companies that are not constrained, that don't care, that are not uh, adhering to ESG considerations at all. Um, and Busi, maybe you could just start by explaining uh, this ESG concept um, and, uh, and, and whether you see that it's uh, got some value. Thank you, Ross. I think with the ESG movement, because I think it's the, the next buzzword that has, you know, right. taken the mining sector by storm, really tries to, like what Deji was speaking to, integrating social performance into the business performance. And I think the ESG, you know, n narrative and, and considerations speak directly to that. However, there's been great emphasis put on the E, which is the environment. Yes. However, little has been put into the social and somewhat governance as well, where we come in as GGA, of course. So I think that is the main thing that I would critique about the, ES, the ESG and, and its considerations, but also the matrix in which you measure, mm. you know, social requirements and social considerations, which really it needs the mining sector specifically, the, the companies, to think more deeply about how to ensure the local context is understood because that's how you will be able to meet those social requirements and, and considerations. In terms of the movement itself, it definitely holds value and there is traction. However, the focus should not just be on, on the environment, but also focus on the social, which relies with many, many other social um, issues. So that's my, my take on it so far. Fantastic. We see are indeed very thought provoking. So we're talking about 
environmental and social governance. Um, and and Deji, one of the things you mentioned just while we were in conversation before this podcast was uh, the importance of um, of really, uh, you know, as Busi was saying, involving local people. And I suppose it's an extension of your point about participation, real inclusivity. Um, I think part of what Busi has just brought up is the importance of uh, local content, local co participation, uh, and, and maybe you could shed some light on that, but also um, maybe address this question at a broader level of how, how we should, you know, as, as NGOs and yourself as a, a communications specialist, persuade governments uh, about who, who they should choose as partners to, to come and, and do business. You know, so Busi is saying, look, ESG is great, it's, it's valuable, but it's not sufficient, maybe not a sufficient condition to get uh, mining to be the catalyst that it could be. Um, and so what extra things are, are, are needed and, and how would you go about uh, persuading governments, uh, Deji? Well, I think one of the things about creating uh, partnerships is that each member of uh, and, and, and uh, of a stakeholder group has a different interest. Um, the, it, the, the problem is not getting people to see the need for inclusivity. It is who, who is going to champion it, who is going to bring everyone to the table. Because everyone is busy with a focus. The mining industry is busy trying to extract the, and, and run a business. The um, good governance is, is, is busy articulating uh, what needs to be done. The communities are, are busy doing what communities do. But everyone needs to understand how it is important to understand what the other is doing for the benefit of everyone and someone needs to take that role on. In, in my view perhaps the most ideal would be the civil society organization. Unfortunately many civil society organizations have had an adversarial relationship with business instead yeah. of a collaborative relationship and, and that's what needs to happen. There has to be a, a, a new way of looking at, at the mutuality of interest that is involved in, in, in this new way of adding value instead of and preventing the, the cause. So it's important to, to see that we may have different interests, but we are not adversaries. Yeah. And, and in, in, in order to make that uh, possible, you need constant engagement, you need, you need to find common ground and it's, it's never easy. Building partnerships and, and building relationships, building resilience is never easy. It is something that takes time, that takes effort and that requires reinforcement. But business doesn't have the patience for that. And, and in, but someone needs to make business understand the requirement for that yeah. and the long-term benefit of it. And, and one of the ways to do that is to share. I, I had an experience once, um, I forget the name of the group now, but they, they're based in Lausanne in, in Switzerland. And they brought together a number of of companies, some some of them in the extractive business, some in the agricultural business, but they were all multinationals, but they, they, they were specifically chosen because each of these companies have had very good uh, strategic relationships with local communities and, and, you know, they brought them together because they said very too often these conversations take place between government and civil society organizations. We don't hear from the you know, 
uh, from the business side of things, yeah. what's been your, your experience? It was very, very enlightening because you hear all kinds of stories, some of them wonderful stories, some of them really terrible stories. But the important thing is that if people understand that they're not alone, it usually helps. In, in business, people always wonder whether they, they are moving too quickly, whether what they're doing is going to harm not just themselves but the entire industry. And someone needs to frequently bring together groups of people to share experience, to show and validate what works and what doesn't work. And I think that this is a role that um, GGA has always played this role and other uh, civil society organizations need to also step to the plate sure. and, 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 and the, the buzzword for me is inclusivity, is, is bringing people together and making them understand um, how it works better when everyone is involved. Got you, yeah, thank you Deji. So Busi, we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> Um, Busi, you, you know, you mentioned this uh, issue of, of Zimbabwe and how the resource curse manifests, what kind of anatomy uh, or shape it, it takes. And, uh, and maybe just in closing, uh, one of the things that struck me about the Zimbabwean situation is the external uh, companies that are willing to do business with this shady elite and almost a shadow state, you know, these cartels. Um, and, and maybe in closing, thoughts from, from both of you on, on how that kind of thing can be prevented in the future, but also appended now in a way that actually helps to reverse some of its more uh, destructive manifestations. Mm, thank you, Ross. I think key here is transparency. Governing by disclosure is critical. And also to ensure that these governing elites are known to be will be held accountable right, right through strong transparency tools that will enable us to ensure accountability is is achieved so i think that's a key the second thing would be more inclusive like how deja was mm. saying and collaborative effort right from the government as well as the industry but most importantly us as a civil society organization to keep these governing elites to account to ensure that we achieve broad-based development certainly for sure, Wusi, and that's, uh, that's what we're about at, at GGA. We certainly will try, yet we, we're also not naive about the reality of how difficult it is actually to change the incentive structure that actually animates these just, contexts. Just to butt in a bit here, do, um, is, do, do you have a process by which you could actually um, see what the industry is up to? in different geographical locations. I mean, if you take the SADC countries, for instance, do, do you have the opportunity or the process by which you could tell? One of the things that I always say is that there's a lot of encouragement when you see that what you are afraid of has already been done elsewhere. And, and so nothing fast tracks a process than seeing that it has been successful elsewhere. So what you need is one company doing the right thing and taking that example to other companies and, and then very soon it becomes standard practice. Yeah. So one way that, that um, transparency is, is very, very important, but everyone is, is like, why must I be transparent when my competitors aren't? We're all in the same industry and you're giving them undue advantage over me by asking me to reveal things that they are not revealing. So there has to be an equal amount of pressure and encouragement to get people to that point where they, they understand the value of being transparent. For sure. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? I think and process. Just on top of my head, I, I go back to the, the EITI initiative that's really trying to make headway uh, with, with transparency and improving tra transparency. However, political will is required in this, in this instance where you need governments to partake willingly 
for the betterment of, 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 the, of the country and, and, and society. In terms of the, the process in which we get everyone on board will require, again, a government and that political will and, and pressure from organizations such as ourselves to see what can be incentivized for most and many companies to, to, to join in and really say, these are the books, this is how we want to ensure that we are transparent and make sure that those governing elites are also ex exposed in, in, in the process. But definitely, I, I agree with that, that a good case study, but most importantly, bringing government on board and the political will to, to do so. What incentives would you think would encourage government to be more interested in, in transparency? What, are they, what would incentivize government to, to think this is, um, this is value adding? One of the th things that, you know, the, there's a gentleman called Mo, Mo Ibrahim or something. Yes. He started giving, you know, um, an annual prize for uh, the best African head of state mm -hmm. and, and is based on the corruption index or something. And you know, it's it's um, it's a it's it's encouragement. Mm -hmm. So you I, you have to put pressure and find a way of encouraging people. For instance, every small step that a company takes towards transparency needs to be acknowledged, mm -hmm. needs to be uh, applauded. Right. And, and that helps to, you know, give them support on this journey. It's a difficult journey when you take these small steps, but how to do it? I, I can't think of what to do on the top of my head, but I, I just know that it requires both, it's a pull and push thing. You've got to put the pressure on and, and encourage. Encourage and incentivize where, incentivize. where possible. Mm. The carrot stick. Right but more, right. more, more carrot than, than stick. So, yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. Uh, friends of GGA, we really appreciate you watching this, this podcast, but um, more importantly, I just want to uh, extend a massive word of gratitude to, to Deji for, for having uh, shared with us his, his wisdom. Um, Busi, thank you for participating in the discussion today. I think we really do have our work cut out for us. You know, this, the next step, of course, is to think about processes that we can put in place that help to achieve some of these uh, outcomes that we've spoken about today. Um, but, but I want to leave you with, with Deji's uh, formula. Uh, <laughs> and I, I also want to leave you with this thought that it is critical to mainstream social performance. And I think Deji put it uh, really well best when he said, look, uh, ESG, social license to operate, it's not some tick box thing on the side. It's integral. It is core business. And Deji, something that you, you may have said today, and I may have missed it, but certainly you've said it in the past, is that business performance depends on social performance. And I think that, that's a mantra that we have to keep right. on communicating about. It's, it's got to be built into the ethos of how companies do things and we can play a role uh, as GGA in uh, helping governments to understand that that's how they should approach things as well. You know, they, they're not just a watchdog, they're actually also a participator in a process. And again, to our, our guests uh, watching this show, Please do read Busi's piece and please continue to follow our campaign. Uh, we are committed as GGA to uh, implementing some of the steps that Deji spoke about today, really b becoming a platform uh, and initiating processes by which we do bring all stakeholders together. We, we don't just throw that phrase out there, but actually we are instrumental in doing that. So on that note, thank you so much again to, to my guests. Uh, thank, thank you, you Busi. Thank you, Dej.